So we are in an age of impersonal business. We invest in mutual funds and in companies that we really know little about. Uh, we buy our, our goods, our, our services, and we rarely know who produced them, who grew them. Um, it's really uh, uh, a, a society where we've optimized efficiency, we've optimized production, but we've done that at the expense of connectedness and at the expense of relationship. And it's true also of the relationship between employees and the companies that they work for. Used to, there was a social contract. The employee, in exchange for their hard work, in exchange for their loyalty, they were taken care of by the company. Unfortunately, that has dissolved over the past 20, 30, 40 years, and it hasn't been replaced by something with a similar emphasis on taking care of the individual. So it's also true of the way that Uh, if we could go back one, I don't think my clicker is working here. There we go. Uh, it's also the, true of the way that leaders think about their human capital. Companies continue to get larger. They continue to get more global. And it's harder for leaders to know the people who work for them in that environment. And more and more people are working for large companies. That's been a trend in the United States for the past 20 years. And in fact, a trend since industrialization. Uh, so it's hard for leaders to know the people who work for them, and more importantly, to know the impact of their decisions on those people. So engagement, it's no surprise that engagement is low in this environment. HR Solutions did a study and found that 3.3 of 3.3 million American employees who were surveyed, only 29% felt engaged at work, 59% felt ambivalent, and a full 19% felt disengaged from their work. Something's missing. <laughs> oh, I'm not missing. He's not missing. Yeah. Um, the reason it's lower is because it's burning, burning, burning. Okay. Yeah. So, you want to keep this here? Yes. So, if I could do a virtual clicker, if there's someone there who can uh, click for me behind the I scenes. Say, uh, <laughs> <laughs> not here. Um, um, if we could go ahead and do that, would you uh, say next slide? Hope that works. Okay. okay. All right. I know the magic word to make this work now. Um, so I learned my lesson about using Prezi instead of uh, PowerPoint. I thought outside the box, it came back to uh, bite me today, but oh well. Um, so, so we're missing something other than a presentation that works. Uh, we're missing connectedness to our, our work. Um, and you know, af after all, we've heard the saying, it's not personal, it's just business, right? We've, we've all heard that. And uh, you know, I think it's really important for us to try to create a society where uh, work can be a part of finding some fulfillment. Create a society where work can be something to counter uh, this trend toward impersonal business. Next slide. So the good news, I think some businesses are ready for this. I think businesses are evolving. They're starting to understand their impact on people, their impact on the environment. Uh, some examples of this, the rise of social entrepreneurship, the rise of benefit corporations, which are now legal entities in at least eight states the rise of the triple bottom line. So I think businesses are ready for a more conscientious type of leadership that's focused on more than just the financial bottom line. It's also focused on individuals. Next slide. So I, I believe that the time is ripe for a new type of leadership. Next slide. So in uh, there was a book written in 1932 by Herman Hesse. It's a, a novel called Journey to the East. And it's about a group of people who went on a pilgrimage to the East to find the ultimate truth. And uh, one of the characters in this story is a servant named Leo, who would do the menial chores of the group, but he also supported the group through his spirit, uh, his stories, his songs. At some point, the journey was going great, but at some point, Leo disappeared. The group fell apart. They abandoned their pilgrimage. And another member of this group, the narrator, many years later, he came across Leo. And Leo took him to the group that had sponsored the journey in the first place. And the narrator found out that Leo, who he had only known as servant, was actually the leader of this group. Next slide. So this, uh, fast forward to the 1960s in the United States. There was a man named Robert Greenleaf who was working at AT&T who felt we had a crisis of leadership in the United States. 
He read this book. He was inspired by it. And he penned an essay in 1970 about the leader as servant first. He introduced the term servant leadership. Next slide. It's about a people-centric type of leadership. It's about viewing people not as means to the company's end or the means to your end, but really having a commitment to them as individuals, to thinking of them as whole people, and having a commitment to their growth. Next slide. So I believe that it's, it's a great way to kind of bring a very personal touch to business. And I want to tell you a little bit about my foundation and interest in servant leadership. Next slide. Brings me to good old mom. Uh, you know, mom was, uh, she was incredibly selfless, incredibly giving of her time in raising my sister and myself. She was slow to judgment. She was quick to compassion. She listened nonstop to things that I am sure now she had absolutely no interest in hearing. <laughs> she was very patient, and I really think uh, she was the quintessential servant leader. Next slide. I was also influenced by my faith community. In college, I found out about a group uh, called the Mennonites. Now, if you think about Mennonites, you might think about a horse and buggy, if you're familiar with them. Uh, I can assure you that modern-day Mennonites in the US drive cars, live in cities, use technology, surf the interwebs, and uh, occasionally even run technology companies. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's very different than you might have the, the mental image in your mind of. But it started in the 1500s, around the time of the Protestant Reformation. It was started by a guy named Minnow Simons. And he believed something pretty radical at the time about individual freedom. He believed that instead of being forced to join a state church, people should make their own individual decision uh, about if and where they went to a church. This was a radical idea at the time. And it was based on a very egalitarian view of people. Uh, so, so the church, the Mennonite church grew out of that. And uh, in the modern day, it takes the form of things like congregational autonomy, democratic churches. And in my faith community, uh, things that are emphasized include things like participative decision making, uh, a service ethic, and choosing leaders who really represent that. Next slide. So this really became the base camp for my journey and my exploration of servant leadership. Next slide. So how does that play out in the real world? It's a great idea, leaders who care about others, who are focused on service. Uh, but what happens when that encounters modern day business in the United States? Uh, what is that space between theory and practice? So I'll talk about five ways here. I believe that, that servant leadership and the egalitarian ethic inherent in that predisposes one toward broad-based ownership, broad-based equity sharing. So what I mean by that, by broad-based, I mean ownership by the many, not the few or the one. And uh, uh, it, in my day job, I'm CEO and majority owner of a company called Community IT Innovators. We are a company with a social mission, a triple bottom line focus. We've had that since the beginning. Um, but one of the challenges with ownership is that uh, you know, how, it, there's going to be a transition in ownership at some point. Anytime you have a company, it's just a question of when. And so what happens to those values? What happens to that triple bottom line focus? What happens to the social mission when you have that transition of ownership? Uh, so we decided that the best solution to that was employee ownership. The employees are the ones who are closest to the impact of those decisions. The employees are the ones who experience the effects of those decisions. And in our specific case, we chose something called an ESOP, an Employee Stock Ownership Plan. The employees elect the board, and uh, the idea is that they elect the board members who are friendly to these ideas and will ensure that it continues in the life of the company. Next slide. So the next idea is purpose. And uh, by that, I mean just what we're about in the, wor in the world, in our lives, uh, what the company's about. Um, this really came together for me at an employee ownership conference in 2004. I went to a session by Whitney Walpole. And she talked about a system that combined, an approach that combined uh, nurturing individuals' purpose in a company, providing them input and ownership uh, of their goals, and providing a system of accountability for that. And uh, uh, I was really struck by that and how she was able to articulate a system in which 
It was attentive to people's dreams, and it allowed them to co-create their goals and their role in the company. And I think it provides a context for a new kind of social contract, a type of social contract where the company and the leaders are taking care of the individuals in the company and, and care about them as individuals. In fact, I think this is the highest calling of leaders, to seek to know their people, to understand their dreams, and to help them to work towards those. Next slide. I think servant leadership also, uh, uh, the egalitarian ethic in that also leads to participative decision making. I was called into leadership at an early age in my professional life. I really didn't know what I was doing, so I had to lean on the wisdom of the group out of necessity, so it was very natural for me. Uh, and consensus decision making was also something that was a very natural part of that. What do you do with consensus as a company grows, though? Try it with 15 people, with 50 people. It's really a recipe for losing your patience, if not your mind. And uh, it becomes very challenging. So we did it well sometimes, poorly sometimes. Uh, and these days, in a company of 40-some, it takes the form of input. Leadership has to make a decision. What are you seeing? What are you experiencing? And it takes the form of delegation, letting people choose how they do something and own the results of that. Next slide. One example of when that went particularly poorly was in 2006, when we tried to team source some strategic planning in the business. And uh, we really ended up with uh, one recommendation for kind of the organizational structure. We really wanted to de-emphasize formal hierarchies and top-down leadership. But by the time we did that, our org chart looked like an M.C. Escher drawing. It was kind of a nightmare. Who do I report to? And oh, they're reporting to me sometimes. And it was really a mess. It was good intentions. But it was, uh, it was really poorly done. Um, and, and in the end, our fears about that traditional formal model didn't come to be the formal hierarchy in the organization. And I came to believe out of that experience that it's much more important to have servant leaders in those leadership roles than it is to try to have an egalitarian, strange sort of org chart. Uh, the style of the leader is more important than the structure of the organization. Next slide. So how does an organization like this get to the point to where it considers layoffs? Well, we were having a great year in 2008. We hit the Great Recession. We cut everything we could before payroll was basically the only thing left. And uh, we went to staff to ask what else they'd be willing to sacrifice to keep colleagues on. They were willing to sacrifice. It wasn't enough, though. So over the next 18 months, through attrition, through layoffs, we lost about a quarter of our staff. It was an extraordinarily painful time. Uh, but, and, but we would have gone out of business if we didn't take that step. The needs of the many, as it were, outweighed the needs of the few. And I feel like we were true to the values of servant leadership by doing that as a last resort and really by supporting people in that transition. Next slide. So these are the, way that, the, the ways that servant leadership has played out in our business. Next slide. And if you're wondering about the effectiveness of it, I would point you to Dan Pink and his thoughts on motivation. Uh, he speaks to autonomy and purpose and mastery being key to motivation. And if you think about servant leadership in those terms, servant leadership provides more autonomy to people. It roots that in purpose and it provides the opportunity for mastery and growth. So I urge you, next slide, I urge you to consider servant leadership, to explore that, to bring connectedness, to bring relationship to work, and to make business personal once again. Thank you.